everybody. One of the most interesting facets of getting older is when you start to remember all of those things that, when you were younger, you were absolutely obsessed with. Maybe it was your favourite restaurant, perhaps that band whose lead singer you had a real thing for, or maybe, in my case, it's a car. However, for whatever reason, you go a few years without revisiting that thing that once upon a time you loved so much, and you begin to wonder, was I simply smitten? Was I really in love with it because it was that good or was it just the in thing? Maybe I just didn't have the experience to realise that what I thought was the best thing ever, in fact, wasn't. And then sometimes you'll go back and revisit this thing, listen to that album and go, oh my, that's dated really rather badly. But every now and again you'll revisit something and go, Oh my word, no, that really, really is that good. And such is the case with the Lotus Evora, a car that not only I really like, but just about everybody did at one point or another. You see, when this car first came out back in 2009, Autocar declared it their best handling car ever. Evo then went and said it was their car of the year, competitions in which it beat the likes of Ferraris, Porsches and Lamborghinis. And now, 15 years later, I'm going to be telling you why I think not only is this still a brilliant car, but if you are thinking of buying a genuine bona fide supercar like a Ferrari, a McLaren or a Lamborghini, you would be an absolute fool not to consider one of these first. As a mid-engined 2 plus 2 V6, the Evora was always destined to be a bit of an odd duck. However, as soon as it landed, there were many who said this really was a Lotus that deserved your consideration. You see, for a long time at that point, the range had consisted essentially of the Elise. The Esprit had been retired over half a decade before and was already a very old car. And whilst the Elise is a very, very good thing, it is really an occasions car, a high days and holidays car, one that you probably wouldn't want to daily drive. And yes, I know plenty of people do daily drive Elises, but in the same way as you can daily drive a motorbike, it doesn't mean that everybody wants to. The Evora, though, was a totally different proposition. All new from the ground up, built on the same architecture as the Elise, but with an all new chassis, a common misunderstanding, still bonded and extruded aluminium, a technology which even in 2024 is still fairly advanced, it was a work of art. Many complained about the Toyota derived 3.5 litre V6 which sat in the back, but let's be honest here, if you are going to trust anybody to build an engine, it's Toyota. And as it happens, both Lotus and Toyota have been working together for over 40 years. And when you consider the issues that Porsche had had at that point only recently with the likes of the 996, 997, 911, the Boxster and the Cayman and its engines, I think Lotus made a very, very smart move. I wouldn't go so far as to say it was ever a great looking car, owing in part due to the slightly odd proportions dictated by a 2 plus 2 layout, however it's still distinctive. It will certainly turn heads where a 911 simply won't. And one of the things that I loved about having my Evora, a later 400, with slightly sharpened looks is the fact that it was a car that got so many conversations started. People were curious as to what it was, who made it, how fast it was and how much it cost. And on that front, people almost always got it totally wrong. You see, the regular Evora, when new, was about a £50,000 car. This later Evora S, more like a £55,000 to £60,000 car, and my Evora 400 was about a £70,000 car. Yet everybody thought it was either a 35 grand car or a 135 grand car. 
On a many an occasion, it got mistaken, okay, albeit mostly by children, for either a Ferrari or a Lamborghini. And uh, that made me very, very happy indeed. And the reason that I bought an Evora 400 was that at the time I really did want a Ferrari, likely a 360 or an F430, or maybe even a Lamborghini Gallardo, but I knew that I simply couldn't afford the upkeep. And with the Lotus doing over 32 the gallon on a run and also having a factory warranty, I knew that if it did go wrong, it wasn't going to cost me any more. And though that was accurate, it did unfortunately go wrong a little bit more often than I would have liked. And so that and many other reasons conspired to get me out of an Evora for some time. But over the last few years, I have been able to revisit it. And this week, I have had the pleasure of this gorgeous Evora S, courtesy of Doug from the channel Nightfall Drives. He's got my Aston Martin N400 Roadster, and I have this. And with the weather as it is, you would think that he's got the good end of that bargain. But I'll tell you something, though this isn't really how I remember an Evora, because mine was a later one with the facelifted exterior and interior, there are certain things common to all Evoras. And if you're unfamiliar with the range, yes, it did improve, did change, did get a little faster, more aggressive over time, but it was still fundamentally the same car from 2009 until it was discontinued around 2019. Now I think it is fair to say that I have always had a soft spot for the Evora because it is one of those with which I started this YouTube channel. In fact, the very first video was me going to collect my Evora 400 up in Leeds. And uh, if you want to do me a favour, please don't watch that video, it's terrible. I did some 25,000 miles in just over two years in that car and I've got to say I was really rather smitten with it and very sad to see it go but there were reasons why at that point in time it was the right thing. Just five minutes behind the wheel of Doug's car though, and I'm reminded of not just the good or the bad, but the whole Lotus experience. And let's start with some of the negative, but I think quite amusing things. Because you see, when I started this channel, I knew that it was going to be really, really important, Lotus having the reputation that they do for unreliability, to be absolutely brutally honest about anything that went wrong. Because if you weren't, why would people believe you about the good stuff? And in the case of Doug's car, well, we have little things like the fact that in all Evoras, the uh, steering wheel is a, a little bit too far away from the Ford Focus derived stalks. To fix this, Doug has then clipped a pair of bicycle brake pads to each of the levers, <laughs> which it does just make me chuckle. I kind of just got used to it in my car, but he clearly didn't want to. This car also has a bit of an annoying whistle from up here, which is rather frustrating. And also, if you want to get out of the passenger side, you have to wind the window down and then lean out and operate the latch from the outside because the inside lever has also broken. This gear shift here is also terrible, something that many early Evoras were criticized for and that Lotus did improve a little bit during this model's run and then fix completely for the 400, where they introduced a whole new linkage and they really did make it dramatically better. Both the gauges and the screens either side of them also now look quite dated and to be honest, a little bit naff too. But beyond that, there is a huge amount to really like about this car. And let's begin with the driving position because as soon as you drop yourself into the cabin, which is a little tough because it's got a very high sill, sort of McLaren style, however, you sit further forwards than you would in a McLaren. They dropped it down a little bit for the 400. But once you've got past that, what you're left with is an incredible view out. You've got this really dramatically curved windscreen and something I like about these early cars, matching it, this gorgeous interior that wraps from one side to the other. It's very, very special. The quality of materials, I think, in these early cars is also better than in the later ones. This one in particular is sort of half leather, 
half Alcantara, and though my preference would always be for the former, you could have had your Evora in just about any way you wanted. You could have also had your Evora in any number of different colours. This one is fairly subdued and it's called Nightfall Blue which is where Doug got the name for his channel. And in case you're curious about what it is that he does over there, it's a mixture of driving and talking about his car and the experiences, the places that he goes with it, and also talking to owners about their cars. I have been in one of his videos and I'll put a link to that in the description down below. It is also fairly incredible that even when you're sat in here, you can easily forget the fact that this is a two plus two. Now I use that term sparingly, partly because those back seats aren't particularly useful even to many a child, and also because in this particular car, it's not actually a two plus two at all. This is the two plus naught configuration. So rather than seats back there, you've instead got a parcel shelf, which is how I'd always want one of these, but most people found that as a lot of owners did use those back seats, the sensible thing to do is to get your car with them and then just not use them. For the later 400, in order to try and make a little more room in the back, they really thinned down all of the padding. And so to take out the back seats was just a case of grabbing two cushions, ripping them out and chucking them in the garage. Not really particularly involved. Now, just in case you are unfamiliar with the Evora range, and I would forgive you entirely if you were, when it launched as the Evora, it had a naturally aspirated version of that Toyota engine, making 280 horsepower. They later then introduced the Evora S, of which this is an example, and it makes 350 horsepower, all courtesy of a supercharger now bolted to the same engine. At that time, other things which were previously optional also became standard, including the likes of the close ratio gearing which Lotus introduced early on and the reason they had to do that is because the gearbox here is actually from a Toyota Auris diesel. You see this engine is used in a lot of Toyotas but only ever with an automatic. You can also now rev it higher than Toyota ever did so the car in normal mode will go to 6600 rpm but in sport around 7000. And it is when you get to a nice, beautiful little bit of British B Road, this car delivers a masterclass in dynamics and just why Lotus is held in such high regard. <laughs> Last month I have also had on my driveway a McLaren 720S which has a bit of a story attached to it but in the last couple of weeks I have been driving it a fair bit and on paper that car should absolutely wipe the floor with this because not only is it about a decade newer it has a carbon chassis developed essentially by a lot of the people that also worked on the likes of the Evora. McLaren was founded with a lot of ex-Lotus engineers. It also weighs just about the same, so just over 1,400 kilos, really rather light. It also makes more than twice the power, considerably more torque, and has vastly more sophisticated gearbox and suspension. Yet, <laughs> there is something just inherently right about the Evora. And one of the big surprises really is just how keen this engine still feels. No, it's not the fastest thing out there. And if you're used to the likes of a Nissan GTR, a 911 Turbo, or well, most other modern day fast things, it's not going to feel especially quick, but I expected it to be a real disappointment and yet it's not. Sure, it needs some revs to do its very best work. However, thanks to that supercharger, it's actually got quite a bit more low down than you might imagine. In fact, I remember testing my Evora 400 against my friend's 911 GT3, a 991, and at about three or 4,000 RPM, I felt like the Lotus had at least as much pull. Granted, my car ran out of steam at 7,000 
and he's at 9,000. But on the road, you don't often get the chance to rev any car out, and so that mid-range performance is really quite important and this delivers it in spades. Yet, that is not what dominates the experience of a Lotus Evora. Instead, it is that absolutely sumptuous combination of handling and ride. There is, I think, almost no car out there better suited to a road like this than this. And that might have something to do with the fact that these cars were developed on exactly these kind of roads. And in fact, I have driven many a Lotus on the very roads where they would have been developed over in Norfolk. It's just fabulous. Okay, the S is a little firmer, a little sharper than the original, but still, by most modern standards, it is very comfortable indeed. In fact, compared to that McLaren, which is actually surprisingly stiff, this thing is like getting into an old sofa. Sure, it's double wishbone at all four corners, but it's a passive setup with Ibex springs and Bilstein dampers. The gearbox <laughs> is not good at all. I really don't like it. Lots and lots of play in it, and as you heard there, I went from first to second, just, just couldn't get it. It's such a weakness in these early cars. It's a cable operated system. It's very, very sensitive. And even depending on the temperature at the time you go to drive the car, it may be better or worse. And yet it should speak volumes about this car's other qualities that you do soon, not quite forgive it, but do ignore it. Easily the star of the show when it comes to, well, let's be honest here, any Lotus is the steering. This is just perfect. It is beautifully weighted, and one thing many Lotus enthusiasts don't really like to admit to is that might have something to do with the fact that this car has just about the same weight distribution as a 911. Look at an Evora from above and you'll see exactly what I mean. Because that engine is taken from a car where it's intended to be a front-wheel driven item, the centre line of the powertrain is only something like two or three inches ahead of the axle. And so you'll see that that engine is almost all the way back. This means that the car has a beautiful, nice, light front end. And in fact, at one point, I think I did the maths, and compared with an equivalent Aston Martin V8 Vantage, there's something like 300 kilos less over the front axle. But compared to an Elise, there's also still quite a bit more, which does actually give this car something of an advantage on account of the fact that those being so light can sometimes be problematic. You go into a bend and there just really isn't much pressing down on the front. And if the tires aren't right, the road isn't good, the car will understeer. And on occasion, that can lead to you having a very, very bad day. I always felt like my Evora was a far, far more trustworthy car when the conditions weren't quite right. It just had that much more mechanical grip. Now, truth be told, a lot of Lotus people just didn't like the Evora, partly because they didn't understand it, but I think more because they just never gave it a chance. Or even worse, if they did, they got out of their Elise and into this and went, no, this is horrible, I hate it, it's all mushy, soft and really slow. It's not. This is a seriously quick car. It's just an awful lot more refined than an Elise. Far quieter, far more cosseting, though frustratingly, because of the way the storage has been set up, I can't actually fit my camera kit in this anymore. When I had an Evora, I bought bags for the car and then made my kit fit in them. Today, I have a camera bag, which is a regular airline carry-on size, and um, I, I, I can't fit it in this. So weirdly, in terms of boot space, the McLaren actually beats this. And if you can live with just soft bags or you simply don't need to take that much luggage about, well, the storage is still adequate and there is, technically speaking, just about room for a set of golf clubs in the boot. Though you might need to get yourself a particularly small bag and maybe remove your driver, but it can be done in a way that it could never in a 911. So there's that. Here we go. This section here, for example, this is a really rough and awful piece of road, and yet the car just takes it in its stride. Turning is lovely. It's not a hyper quick rack, 
That actually reminds me a little bit of the old Porsche 996 GT3 that I drove the other day. It's faster than that, for sure. And I tell you what, you look down and you realize you, you're actually carrying a, a fair amount of speed. Back in the day, I said this must be one of the fastest things, point to point, and I still think there's a lot of truth to that, because even though ultimately that McLaren will go around all of these corners quicker, there are also quite a few cases where, because the road's got lumps and bumps and ridges and dips in it, in a supercar, you got to back off, because you're worried about it hitting the ground. In this, nothing of the sort, and it really does just flow with the road. I also absolutely love the view out of Innovora. I always have and I always will. Between that gorgeous wraparound glass house to those haunches in the corner, which are even more pronounced than many a 911. Oh, this is really properly special. And yeah, sure, owning a Navora is not necessarily going to be the easiest thing. It isn't for any Lotus. The factory are notoriously difficult to deal with. Spare parts can be a pain. Heck, even when they were making the cars, spare parts weren't easy to come by. Occasionally, servicing and things can be expensive. And yes, doing a clutch on one of these is going to be about four or five grand, but the clutch should also last absolutely ages anyway, at least 50,000 miles, if not quite a bit more, with the appropriate treatment. And the Evora is one of those cars that, no, wasn't ever destined to sell in 911 numbers, but it really did deserve to do an awful lot better than it did. The Knight Rider, there's a, there's a kit replica just gone past. Oh, day made. And look, I know there are a thousand and one reasons why you might prefer to get a 911 instead of an Evora. That's fine, that's cool, you know what, I'm at peace with that. But there are also a whole heap of reasons why you should get one of these cars. And if you have been thinking of buying your first supercar, maybe you're looking through the classifieds of Gallardo's 360s, F430s, perhaps even the odd McLaren, and you're in that position where you're thinking, yeah, it's doable, but, but it's a bit of a stretch, should I? Well, let me tell you right now, this car deserves your attention. It is a good, or at least interesting looking car. It has an unusual badge on it. It's rare. It even, with the right exhaust, or in standard guys for the later ones, makes a nice noise. This one now has a valved tubular setup on. Lovely. It might have the engine from it, but it doesn't sound like your granddad's Camry, does it? But the biggest thing for me is the simple fact that this thing drives like very little else. Reading through the autocar test from 2009 this morning, which featured some very, very serious machinery, 911, 997, GT3, Lamborghini, Murcielago, SV, there was only one tester, Andrew Frankel, in case you were wondering, who didn't rate the Evora as their winner. That is a pretty incredible thing for the Lotus to have achieved. And that was the original, that was the regular Evora, not S. Evo later heaped similar praise on it. And the fact is, praise like that does not come accidentally. That does not come because it's the flavor of the month. You gotta remember, 2009 and Lotus didn't have anywhere near the fanfare around it that it does now, or did at least 18 months ago. This was a company that at the time was in a very, very difficult position. This was supposed to be their bright new future, and unfortunately, it didn't pan out that way. But they really, really put the effort into it. And today, for around 30 odd thousand pounds, you can reap the rewards of their hard work. Because the Evora is still an absolutely magnificent car to drive. And if you're into that, the art or the business of driving, as I often call it, yeah, sure, this isn't perfect. Gear change in these early cars, already mentioned, horrid. And trying to heel and turn this thing has always been needlessly difficult as well. I, I don't know quite why they never really got it perfect. But even that aside, these are just wondrous. They're also a little bit different, a little bit interesting, and 
if you can happily live with one of these, you can deal with it and you like the experience, well, it'll then give you a benchmark that your Ferrari has to beat because it's likely going to be a lot more money. It is going to show you just how good a car can be to drive and the Lotus experience is sort of halfway or maybe a little bit closer to that of running a Ferrari in terms of working with the dealers, actually Ferrari are better, and cost of service maintenance and all that. Consider it maybe a dry run for getting your very first Ferrari. And I absolutely promise you, and this is a drum I have been banging for eight and a half years now. If you are at a dealer looking for a sports car and there is an Evora in there, just give it a go. Half an hour of your life it might cost you a fair bit of money, but honestly, I don't know that many people that got into this seat of an Evora and got out that didn't buy one and I can't think really of much higher praise than that. So, there we go. That is the Lotus Evora S, and like all Evoras, it's a great car. I wanna say a big thank you to Doug for lending it to me, and as ever, don't forget to hit the like button, comment down below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.